A very warm welcome to all of you. It's a rainy morning here in Bern in Germany, and I hope you're all very comfortable here and wherever you are in front of your computers. Um, this is our session um, in the event of the World Health Summit. And in the next 90 minutes, we want to focus on evidence-based decision-making in global health. For this, we, of course, use COVID-19 as our example. We want to answer the question what evidence is and how it is used in making decisions about COVID-19. We also want to focus on the relevance and models of research, policy relations, and mutual influence. We are very glad to welcome very experienced researchers and policymakers as our speakers. Before we introduce them, um, we would like to introduce ourselves. Um, Eva, maybe you can introduce yourself as my wonderful co-moderator for this session, and maybe also tell the audience a little bit what you and I, together with our teams, did in the last month um, in supporting the German government for its COVID-19 response. Well, a very warm welcome from my side as well. Uh, thanks very much, Maike. My name is Eva Rafus. I'm the Chair of Public Health and Health Services Research at the LMU Munich. Um, I'm very engaged with both evidence-based public health, which to some extent is the focus of this session, but also with uh, global health. And I think with that, um, I'd really like to change the spotlight to our speakers. Um, um, and maybe start off by introducing you to Yvonne Doyle, who's with us today from the UK. Yvonne is the Medical Director and Director of Health Protection at Public Health England. She's a medical doctor and a public health specialist and has been really at the forefront of managing the UK response to COVID-19 um, and has given her institution, Public Health England, really at the interface between science and politics. She has a very distinguished career um, in the UK with the National Health Service, but also the Department of Health and Social Care, but also in both academic and um, independent sector roles. And in 2016, Yvonne was appointed a companion of the Order of the Bath for her services to public health. So very warm well welcome to Yvonne. And maybe I'll just continue to introduce our next panelist, uh, Frode Forland. Moving further north to Norway, Froda is the Director of Infectious Diseases and Global Health at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. He's also a medical doctor and public health specialist, and he leads the Norwegian National Contact Tracing Program. Um, he's also a member of the Corona Response Leadership Group, so you can see immediately why he's here today. He's also very well known for his work in evidence-based um, public health and global health in Africa, where he's also lived um, for many years and done research, but also with the European Centers for Disease Prevention and Control. Frodo also coordinates Norway's contribution to the global health security agenda. With that, I'll pass back to Micah for the introduction of our other two panelists. Thank you very much. Before I continue introducing our wonderful speakers, I'll introduce myself. I forgot that, sorry. My name is Michael Foss. I am a health and political scientist and researcher at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, which is a think tank here in Berlin. I'm leading the global health governance research team. And Eva and I were very much involved in um, the scientific committee advising the German government also in their COVID-19 response. But I now continue with um, Dr. Fernando Simon. He is also a medical doctor and epidemiologist and currently the director of the Coordination Center for Health Alerts and Emergency in the Spanish, um, Spanish Ministry of Health. He also has a lot of lots of experience, for example, in this special committee on Ebola in 2014 in Spain, with leading positions in research centers for tropical diseases, for example, in Mozambique and Burundi. And um, Mr. Simon is also a member of several committees I've read and working groups of the European Union, the European Center for Disease. Um, for disease prevention and control and the World Health Organization. So we have here a little bit now more also the policy side um, decision making in the Ministry of Health and I'm very much looking forward to discussing your experiences with you. And we have with us um, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, 
um, pediatrician and clinical scientist and our chief scientist at the World Health Organization. I'm very pleased to have you with us today. Um, before your current position at WHO, you were WHO Deputy Director General for Programs and you have um, experiences in being the secretary of the Department of Health Research at the Ministry of Health and Welfare in India, as well as being formerly the Director General of India's Council on Medical Research. So we have here the research side also at WHO and a lot of experience in bringing evidence into policy making. Some few words on housekeeping before we start with our um, uh, discussion and session here. I'm very sure most of you in our audience know Zoom and Zoom calls. Um, to engage with our speakers, you find the Q&A button um, on, your, on your window. So please feel free to use it as much as you can to send short questions, ideally um, um, indicating to which speaker you wish an answer for. All questions will be saved um, and we will pick some um, for, um, of them for our discussions, but all will be saved and sent to our speakers after the event. The structure of our event is divided into three parts. First, we will start with a spotlight on decision making. Then we will follow up with a discussion and using the, the questions in the Q&A. And then we will focus in the next spotlight on evidence and the absence, the existence, the quality and models of evidence. So I would like to dive deep now into the spotlight of decision making. Um, in our current times, decision-making in policy and research changed a lot. I'm thinking of speed, actors to involve, pressures from the public, changing evidence, uncertainty of effectiveness and safety. I have now a question to all of our speakers and Yvonne, maybe you would like to start with answering um, the question from your experience gained during the response to COVID-19, how are decisions being made and what is the role of evidence in these decisions. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Micah, and good morning. Uh, good morning, friends and colleagues, and thank you very much for uh, setting this session up. I think it's really very helpful to all of us, and I hope it'll be helpful to those who are listening as well. So I have tried to answer the question with um, a visual uh, view of uh, what I have experienced in the last uh, nine, 10 months. And could I have the first uh, slide, please, uh, which is, I think, just the, the introductory slide. But let's move on to the actual visual, because this helps me to. Uh, so the next slide, please, will show us uh, what I want to say. And I know I have to do this in five minutes, is that right? Or eight minutes, a statement anyway, or less. So please stop me if I'm speaking uh, too long. So I would start with epidemiology um, and I was asking the question to myself, what exactly have we used here in the UK to inform the decisions that we have had to make, which are very dynamic? Uh, and these decisions you know, change and they need to change in the light of the emerging evidence. The question is, what is the evidence that we're using? Well, we started up in the left-hand corner with the epidemiology, as always. And at that point in January, it was international epidemiology. Um, and very quickly, we were able to call on our expertise in modeling. And that began to um, instruct us about scenarios, about worst case scenarios, uh, based on previous experience of pandemics, but also on what we ought to do about our borders and travel and where risk was likely to arise. So epidemiology and modeling were the initial pieces of evidence that we as policy advisors uh, used uh, with, with our colleagues and with government. And then as the months went on, we looked at, obviously our researchers were investigating collaboratively with many actually on this call and beyond, WHO of course as well, um, you know, what, what was the virus like? What was it doing? How did it interact with people? So viral knowledge became very important and very helpful, uh, you know, around asymptomatics, around uh, incubation periods and so on, around severity. And in these months, we had also set up clinical networks, which gathered really useful information about clinical outcomes from our first admissions. 
uh, and differential outcomes between groups in the population. So this was all, I would say, an orderly progression of the use of rational evidence. When we got to the end of our first, and we can talk a lot about what happened in the first wave, but let me just move through this fairly quickly. And um, we moved into May, June, July, into the summer months, uh, and then beyond into what was looking like an upswing again in September. The three areas that uh, are called place-based knowledge, behavior and ethics, and rapid assessment became much more active pieces of evidence alongside the pure evidence of epidemiology, I would call it pure, and research and modeling. And it's the interaction of all these that I think would be very interesting to explore in terms of the limits of research, in terms of the connections between research and practice, uh, and also practice-based evidence. In other words, what we're beginning to find in the field that influences the modeling, for instance, or indeed our understanding of uh, what, you know, what policy ought to be. So place-based knowledge was important in uh, the UK because the virus spread very broadly. It was started in uh, with travelers, but it moved quickly into cities and then it moved into groups that experience inequalities in health and very vulnerable groups, for instance, in care homes. This wouldn't necessarily be different in other countries, but the scale of this in the UK was interesting. So place-based knowledge, what was happening, and then particularly from population through to individuals, how people were losing it, you know, how, how people were, were living their lives, how different populations reacted to the virus, what people believed, how they complied with things like isolation became very important and still are. We did uh, impose a number of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, as you all did, various restrictions on people's lives and activities. And what has become really important is the attribution of success to those various interventions. So which of those is most likely to contain the virus? Is it mass gatherings? Is it what people do in their households? Is it what happens in the workplace? Is it what happens in the pub where people drink? You know, what is it about uh, our interventions that we're stopping that is most likely to be successful and is worth the sacrifice that people are being asked to make? These have become much more difficult to uh, measure than the epidemiology, for instance, which is pretty straightforward. And then into decision making. So I have used what we uh, understand as the ladder of state interventions here to demonstrate how information in the top part of this slide can feed in and how quickly this moves down towards the uh, more restrictive ends of the ladder of state interventions. So the state is expected to support science and the state is expected to protect people in various ways uh, and communicate and set up programs that require people to cooperate, for instance, on mass testing, uh, on contact tracing. What has been interesting also is the entry in very definite ways of legal uh, regulations and prosecutions into this ladder of interventions. It's part of a package and decision making has to be very clear which part of this ladder of interventions the decisions are informing and how valid those uh, decisions are. They are challenged more and more, as I'm sure others will experience in terms of the validity of the research, the fact that this is novelty, do we really know what this, what, what does work? Um, are we correct in terms of, is it fair? You know, is it fair to have certain parts of the country to have to do things while others don't? Shouldn't we all do it? Or if we all do it, is that fair to the people who have less epidemiology? These are the challenges that evidence is now facing. Uh, and it's a, really what I'm saying is it's a combination of this evidence and sometimes we're at the limits of the evidence really to be able to explain fully why it is important for people to do certain things in their lives that are very restrictive. 
Um, I'm going to stop here because I haven't really answered your question. I'm simply expressing what we have done and what the dilemmas we face are. Decisions have been made, quite happy to discuss that. Uh, but increasingly, I see the issues around behaviour, ethics, uh, assessment and you know, challenge as the issues we're now dealing with, inevitably. The, sec the next slide, please, if you could just show it, is how we have used this in a practice situation, and that is to keep schools open. So we have a number of national aims that are explicit. Uh, and the national aim for children is for the vast majority of children, it's at the bottom of this slide, the benefits of being back in the classroom far outweigh the low risk from the virus. Uh, and schools can take action to reduce the risk. And we have used epidemiology, clinical practice, uh, research-based evidence about risk and knowledge about inequalities and how it's affecting the way schools behave to continue to give confidence that that is the right policy decision and we should do everything we can to uh, ensure that maintains itself, but also that the population have to help us to achieve that aim. So by doing other things, we are able to do this. So that's probably enough for me to, to say and to stop. Thank you very, very much, Yvonne, to, to show us the policy process, basically, and the evidence-informed policy process, maybe. Um, thank you very much for this. I think we will have the opportunity to dive deeper into your example of school closure or not closure. Thank you very much. Um, Sumya, can I ask you now to share your experience with um, decision making at WHO maybe and also what is needed and what the role of evidence in these de decisions is. Thank you, thank you, Micah and Eva. And I think this is a very important topic. Uh, and the question that you asked is very difficult to answer because we heard one example of, from the UK of how they approach it, but different countries have uh, different approaches. And one of the things WHO has been saying is that countries that have done well have not only shown the political will and leadership early on to tackle this, but have also relied on science-based policies and have really gone with the advice given to them by their public health experts, you know, uh, and done all the things that we, not, we know now today work even though they're quite difficult to implement uh, and yet we've seen many countries actually um, still not really putting their full weight behind those strategies which we know work because they've been shown to work in many countries. Now, as far as WHO is concerned we took the view right from the beginning that the science should really inform our um, response and so the science division, which, as you know, was created only in 2019. So it was extremely timely that we had a new science division. We had a department that was dedicated to the quality assurance of our norms and standards. We created another department, the research for health, which would really be looking at scaling up innovations, accelerating the impact of new interventions and products, as well as at uh, doing some foresight, looking ahead to see what uh, new uh, innovations in science and technology can have an impact on public health. And also very importantly, uh, a unit on ethics, bioethics, which we've had for a long time, but we were able to put, pull together a group of bioethicists, globally renowned bioethicists, who debated and discussed on many topics and came up with policy papers on things like the ethics of using artificial intelligence in some of the applications of using contact tracing apps and the way that the data was being used on this concept of an immunity passport on the values and principles that should go behind a fair and equitable distribution system for limit you know products which are going to be in limited supply like vaccines for example but also drugs and diagnostics so we pulled together these groups early in January because we already had this framework called the R&D Blueprint, which had set out over the last couple of years uh, a roadmap for how you would look at an emerging infection. 
and what were the research needs that would be needed. So we immediately had this virtual for the forum, global forum on research and innovation. We had nine working groups that were looking, of course, they were focusing on knowledge gaps and research priorities. And over the last six uh, to 10 months, we've seen our knowledge advance in many of those areas. But in the beginning, we had to do um, the policy guidance with very little evidence. As Yvonne was saying, we relied on uh, past um, knowledge of other coronaviruses and also the emerging data from China. And I must say that we owe a lot to the Chinese scientists and doctors who were the first to see this disease for, for sharing uh, a lot that they were learning about clinical uh, course, about epidemiology, about transmission, including, and they were doing many clinical trials as well. So one of the, I think, defining features of this, pan of this pandemic compared to say previous health emergencies like Ebola has been the global infodemic. You know, the director general spoke about the infodemic very early on and said that the spread of false information was as dangerous as the spread of the virus because we saw um, you have something like, you know, a couple of thousand reports coming out every day, either, you know, press re uh, reports or press releases, preprints, as well as published papers. And for people to be able to sort out the difference between credible information and what is really false or misinformation or rumors uh, was very difficult. And very often you would see that the rumors and the misinformation was spreading much more quickly than the real information. So we started working with a number of partners, including the tech industry, the social media companies really, to see how we could try to control the spread of misinformation and direct people who were searching for things about COVID-19 to the credible sources of information, you know, including the WHO, but also national government public health agencies, you know, the various CDCs, et cetera. That I, I can say has had some limited success, but we also uh, pulled together a huge group of global experts, including social and behavioral scientists. And in fact, this new term of infodemiology was coined and we've had two global uh, symposia on that. Third one is coming up on you know, how do you tackle this? And we've seen this in the past with vaccine mistrust and so on. So this, this is a very important, and while as scientists, we may tend to disregard it or ignore it, it actually has a big impact on people's behavior, on their risk perception, and on their compliance with what the government is asking them to do. We've seen around the world, you know, people who do not believe in simple things like masks, they even question the efficacy of masks. So I think, communicating science and communicating uh, why and how people could comply with what we think are the best. And you know, this changes as well. So as we have seen over time, our understanding of the virus has evolved. So our guidance has changed. Now people take it as um, scientists not being able to make up their mind or, uh, oh, you're changing your mind all the time and you're revising your guidance, but that's what science is about. It's about learning adapting and changing your guidance as you understand more. After all, this is a new virus. We, we didn't know everything in January or February. We know much more now. So for us not to change would be, would be foolish. So I think science has been in the spotlight and it's been good and bad. And, and I think people at least now look to scientists and uh, they're trying to understand how science works. So it's really, it's the same with research. Every clinical trial that comes out, you know, you, you learn a little bit more, you adapt your guidance. So we've formed this uh, evidence collaborative, I can talk about it later, perhaps, of global agencies and institutions who are working together. We have over 90 organizations who are doing evidence synthesis and reviews and collaborating so that we put out the best possible evidence. And of course, we are all under time pressure. So everybody wants the guidance out yesterday. So you have to now really do rapid reviews and speed up the process while maintaining the integrity and the, the basic um, steps that would go, for example, you cannot do a treatment guideline without doing a meta-analysis, without doing a systematic review of all the evidence and looking at it um, before you make those decisions. So I think a lot is explaining the processes 
why it's important, and what are the different elements that we take into consideration before a policy guide is made. And at the country level, again, I think this capacity needs to be built. I think this is my last point that, um, that while we may be doing a good job in some countries, there are a lot of countries which do, had not set up such a mechanism, you know, the health technology assessment and so on. This is necessary. And I hope that now countries will see the value because you have to also contextually adapt global guidance. Uh, the guidance cannot be uniformly applied across our 194 member states. Every country needs to look at their data, their context, their situation, and, and then um, adapt. This, and this is true for all our guidance, not just for COVID-19. So national systems are important. And these need to be set up now where, where they don't exist in order to provide that advice to ministries of health to base their decision making on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, Froda, to the Norwegian Public Health Institute. Can you tell us a little bit how decisions are made at your institute and what role of evidence is influencing decisions there? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and uh, good morning to all. Uh, to me, it's been very interesting to witness how the interplay between observation, data collection, research, summarized research, what is often called evidence, professional judgments, politics and decisions have been displaced uh, during this pandemic. Systems for and ways of handling this cascade of necessary input and output in the decision making processes have shown to be largely different in different countries, as well in main uh, international organization having a role here, the ECDC, WHO, uh, Africa CDC, and others. Surprisingly to many, we've also seen striking differences in the decision-making and organizational systems and structures between the Nordic countries in this regard. So I'll try to give you an outline of how we are working now in Norway in this situation. There is a high level of interaction between three main actors in Norway, the Norwegian Public Health Institute, the Directorate of Health and the government, the cabinet. Every morning, now every second morning, every, as a, every second day uh, from eight o'clock until nine o'clock, there is a digital meeting led by the Ministry of Health with all the relevant partners to report on the epidemiolo epidemiology, which is done by us, on the situation in the healthcare services done by the Directorate of Health and the regional health trusts and to align with all relevant actors in the field about the situation understanding and the, uh, the interactions, uh, interventions that are discussed. And then often formal assignments are given from the Ministry of Health to our institution and to the directorate, often to both of us. And during this weekend, we passed assign assignment number 197 from our Ministry of Health. Some given with long timelines, meaning two or three weeks, most of, most of them with only few days of a deadline. For instance, during uh, last week, we've also seen now a number of uh, cases uh, raising, rising in Norway. And we now have about 30 cases per 100,000 for two weeks in Norway. And on the press conference then last week, the prime minister expressed her concern. Uh, and then uh, on the press conference, there is always one or two ministries in the middle, and then there is the Public Health Institute on one side and the Directorate of Health on the other side. So normally it's the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Preparedness and Justice in the middle. Uh, and then uh, on Friday, the, the Ministry of Health then described the task to us that was given to us with a delivery, time to deliver uh, yesterday midday. And uh, the question was about what kind of strengthening of measures should be taken now to avoid coming into the same situation of uncontrolled spread that we saw in the spring. So relevant questions were about the epidemical situation, the prevalence and incidence. And we've been really stressing that the figures now cannot really be compared to the figures we saw in spring. Since we are testing so many more, we think that in the spring, we uh, recognized maybe 10% only of the real cases. Now we think we recognize maybe 50% of the real cases we have in the society. And then there were questions about uh, effects of local, regional versus national restrictions in this situation, and about uh, measures related to border control and migrant workers, and about uh, closing the bars and restaurants, adherence to the regulation and so on. And numbers of questions that we have to face again 
and try to gather evidence during these few days. So these are just examples that we have been working on during the weekend. And in some situations, we have diverging views with the Directorate of Health. And then the Ministry of Health requires us to explicitly demonstrate that in our answers to the Ministry. So today, I think just now, the Corona Committee of the Cabinet is gathered with the advisors, including the director from our institute, to take a decision on how to strengthen the uh, interventions from uh, now on. And that will be announced on the press conference at four o'clock this afternoon. In addition to this, I would say there is also a huge uh, responsibility in Norway led on the municipal, uh, municipal level. And uh, Oslo municipality have announced their own press conference two hours before the government to say these will be the regulations now in Oslo. So there is also a play between the national, the regional and the local level that we can see in some of these situations. And, and we've been arguing that the best way of trying to control the epidemic is also having quite a bit of flexibility related to responses where the, the uh, spread is most high in areas of Norway still, the spread is very low. And it would be, as in our view, a failure to have two strict regulations that would affect the whole uh, community and the whole country at the same time. So this just as a practical example of how we are working these days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting to learn more about the process and also the coordination mechanisms implemented in, um, in Norway. Um, Fernando, over to you, to the Ministry of Health in Spain. Can you explain to us a little bit about the decision-making process and how decisions are made, and also the, about the role of evidence? I will Thank try. You. I will do my best because it's not been an easy task to do during all this pandemic. It's true that, as, as Yvonne mentioned, we have, we have had two waves and two different ways of uh, using evidence and making decisions. The first period during March and April or February for some countries was completely different to the way we are doing now. Uh, not, not really to the way, the use of the evidence we are doing now. Uh, in the first wave, as Frodo mentioned, we were able of detecting only around 9.7% of the cases we were having in Spain of infected people, not cases. It was, uh, we know that because we carried out a very um, strong and, and very big a seroprevalence study in Spain, and we know what we had, and we, we know what we detected. That marked a huge difference. There was an important incidence, but it was not as high as many people mentioned at the beginning of the outbreak to be able to have in this community immunity or a threshold immunity that could help us to avoid the second wave. That was out of the, of the vision. It was completely full to think about that and it was known very early in the in the evolution of the outbreak. But it's true that at the beginning, the, the major issue we had to deal with was uncertitude. We had little data coming from, from uh, the first country having cases from China. Situation in China was not uh, similar to what we later saw in, in our countries here in Europe. Our paradigm for this virus was SARS back in 2003 or MERS back in the in 2012 and, and the following years. And these viruses that were our, let's say our mirror for uh, understanding the current virus were completely different. They were, had nothing to do with what we were looking at in this new epidemic. So our references were not good. Our evidence was in the process of being built. We did not have evidence enough and then we had to choose between what was proved was almost nothing and what was plausible, what was all the experiences we had with previous pandemics, 1918 flu, other flus, maybe even the SARS in 2003, etc. So we had two different kind of evidence, proof, almost nothing, plausible. We had to work with plausible things even though there was no proof they were effective. That is one of the, of the key points. The other key point is timing. We knew that in China in uh, 23rd January, if I'm not wrong, they locked down the whole province of, uh, of Wuhan, of uh, Hubei. And first it was locked down 
the city of, uh, of Wuhan. Of course, it was kind of a signal for everybody, but it was a signal that was uh, completely different from the rest of the world. It was a single province in a 21 provinces country, uh, closing down, if I'm not wrong, 20 million people more or less, in a country with 1,480 uh, and 800 million people, 1.4 billion people living in the country that could support this small province in, in China. The situation in most, in most countries was completely different. In Spain, if we had to close, to close the country, to lock down the people, either we locked down the whole country at that moment, or we did not do anything because closing small areas within Spain would, wouldn't have the, the desired impact. So having in, the, in hand a very heavy, very strong, very restrictive measure with a heavy impact on economy, on social life, that had to be applied to the whole country. That means also we are within the European Union. We did not have all this support the Hubei province in China had. Finding the right timing for implementing this kind of decisions, a very strong decision, was not easy either. Scientists were advising politicians, but politicians are not only using science for decision making. They have to use also economy, they have to use social perception, they have to use media pressure, they have to use other political issues that usually are out of the scope of scientists. So advising was not easy because we did not have the evidence we were willing to have. We just have plausible things, not prove things. We had to uh, do this with the right timing and the timing was not a decision from, for the scientist, was a decision for the politicians, but based on what scientists were, were uh, proposing. And our major problem here in Spain at the moment of the lockdown was not exactly the transmission, but the collapse of the healthcare system, what was a major concern at that moment. Unfortunately, we did not reach that point, but we were on the point of, of reaching it. We were very close. So that, that was the, the key point where we do a control, fully controlled transmission, or the objective was just to avoid the collapse of the healthcare system. And that was not easy to, to decide neither. Having a, the right objective was not an easy thing to do. So we were in a, in a quite complicated situation from the scientific point of view, uh, because in this situation, decisions based on science, lockdown, was very, very tough for the population, the economy, et cetera. We had never been exposed to such a decision based on scientific uh, points of view. And we're just point of view, not um, solid information or solid scientific information. That was an important problem. The next step we had to do is to implement this, uh, these measures. We had the lockdown is very easy. We just locked down. We need to coordinate very much with the police, with the uh, army, with everybody who is involved in controlling the lockdown. That's something that can, can, can be done. I will talk later about the coordination within Spain. But then we had to face other issues. We had to face legal issues. Uh, most countries in Europe are very much concerned with uh, individual liberties or freedom. So it's very complicated to limit or to restrict any legal right that the population within Europe has already uh, won after many years of fighting for them. So it's really complicated to, to avoid legal constraints for applying such kind of, uh, of measures. The only proposal, the only possibility in Spain is the state of alarm. And that's something that had never been used since the democracy only once, and it was for a very specific issue related with uh, air traffic uh, at the moment due to strike. And it was just concerning uh, soldiers going to take over the um, air controllers for that. So in fact, it had never been used within Spain since democracy. And to use that right now was a very social concern. And that was complicated to avoid in the discussion. It was a very important issue. But we have other measures to implement. We had to propose 
recommend, and in some situations right now, for instance, to make it compulsory, the use of masks. We had to um, propose and uh, implement the use of uh, hydroalcoholic uh, solutions for hand washing. We had to implement many other measures that were not easy. Mainly when we are or when we were in a very complicated market. As you may know, the mask production worldwide is done in a single country, or it was done at that moment in a single country. And this country had closed exportation of any uh, sanitary or health product related with the control of the pandemic because they were needing, needing it. So the only masks available outside China were those that we already had in stock and were not enough. We had to promote a lot of testing. But again, tests for coronavirus, PCR kits were not available of over. Were very limited at that moment, not now, but they were very limited at that moment. And countries producing them, just a handful number of countries, were controlling exportation also because they needed them. So implementing even the more basic recommendations from the scientific point of view was very complicated. And then we have to face a dilemma. We have to face a very important dilemma, which is, uh, should we propose control or transmission control measures that we cannot implement? Or we should propose those that we can implement even if we think they are not as effective as we think? That's not an easy thing to do for a scientist because the scientists want to say what is effective and we don't want to care what is feasible. And at that moment, feasibility was a key point. Mm -hmm. that we could not leave that only to the decision of the politicians. We had to help in that decision. It was not easy. That made, of course, scientists to change the message little by little as far as new availability or availability of, of these products were um, they, they were available for everybody. So at that moment, we had to change some of the recommendations. And we had to face that and we have to explain that. And the explanations were not easy either. Communication was another key point in decision making. What could be easily communicable or what could not? And was a key point also in decision making and for decision makers. Okay. Then at that moment also, I start arising other groups, lobbies, lobbies looking for travel passports, the COVID passport, because I want my workers to be able of working. So I want a passport for my workers. Passports were not a sensitive or a sensible thing to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the whole of the population. They were not useful because we could not, as we could not assure negativity. We could assure negativity at a certain point, not further on. We could not promote these passports in most, in most places because there were not tests enough, enough for testing everybody. So we had to be very careful with all these lobbies that of course they have their interest, their fair interests, but in some cases were not the population, the whole of the population interest. And in some situations, if you put the efforts in um, making happy one of these lobbies, you may put in jeopardy the capacity of the system to properly respond. You have to be very careful with all this. So that was one of the other pressures because they had their rights and they have their, their scientific backup also. And they showed that. So we had to prioritize what was more important or less depending on the quality of the information on the availability of products, et cetera. I'm very sorry, but I think I have to stop you for for now, Fernando. It's very, very interesting. I think it's super uh, a great example, or not a great example, but an example to make decisions with um, where no resources are available or the feasibility points you, you raised. Um, due to timing, I'm very sorry that I have to interrupt you, but I would like to deep a little dive, uh, um, deep a little deeper here and there and also if I would also include the questions now from the chat box together with the questions we have um, prepared um, and maybe Yvonne I would like to ask you first um, 
I would like to shed a little light on different models of research policy relation and mutual influence. Who is involved in decision making um, in the UK? And do decision makers listen to individual experts, scientific advisory committees, WHO, or someone else? So look a little bit at the actors and or, um, at the types of evidence from them. Can you give us some insights there? Yes, Micah. So um, like uh, Froda and Fernando have described, uh, we have our national institutes, uh, our Institute of Public Health, but also the Department of Health, where there is also uh, policy experts uh, and, uh, and our scientific uh, group called the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, which feeds into government directly and is really set up for, for um, individual events and not so much for continuing events, but the Scientific Advisory Group has continued for the whole year, meeting weekly, sometimes twice weekly, and has a number of a, a large number of subgroups. Some are modelers, some are behavioral, some are environmental. So there's a huge scientific endeavor in the UK at the moment behind government uh, advice. Uh, and th that runs, and some of us, uh, I sit on the scientific advisory group. Um, I'm also involved with the Department of Health. So, you know, we all interact. Um, so that's the formal route in which uh, the epidemiology, the modeling, the scientific, uh, you know, advice that we know of, the research is commissioned and uh, is produced for government often at great speed, as has been said. And that is extremely stressful actually for everyone because it's unremitting. But that isn't the only place that um, evidence comes from now. So that's one very important part of the evidence. And it is listened to every day. Um, and there are uh, weekly uh, several uh, meetings uh, between our chief medical officers, uh, between uh, government departments, and then with the Secretary of State for Health and with the Cabinet. There's a very, very uh, full political involvement in all of this. And I would say all of government, all ministers would be familiar with you know, m most of, if not all of what comes from the scientific community. Uh, and they have scientific advisors in every government department that uh, are also involved and can get this information and advise their ministers. So that's the formal bit. Beyond that, there is what I would call a cacophony of advice coming through, you know, um, special advisors to the media. And there are so many uh, scientific students and PhD students who are out of work, who've got jobs advising various uh, parts of the media, uh, uh, you know, on uh, visual media, on social media. Um, so there's that. Uh, there are individual experts who will disagree, as scientists often do, with what the formal scientific advice is. So there's a huge amount of alternative. Now we have, of course, industry, as Fernando has said, with their scientific advisors. And um, you know, examples of that are around uh, what, what quarantine should be and how much travel should be allowed, um, you know, whether factories should remain open. So this has become extremely noisy, all of it. And understandably so. Uh, I'm not saying this is wrong, it's inevitable because of the length of this, the novelty, the complexity, and the profound effect on the economy. So this is quite difficult to navigate, even with the formal routes for scientific advice. Government will need to take other, um, other views into account and other parts of evidence. They will listen to, for instance, the politicians who represent local areas. Um, in local government, but particularly the members of parliament, uh, will have much more place-based knowledge than perhaps some of the scientists sitting on the academic departments will have. Uh, they will also need to take um, advice from the uh, economic ministries, you know, transport, the treasury, the business departments. You know, what is the impact of this? What are the trade-offs? And these are rightly the decisions of government. And they don't always you know, follow exactly purely what the scientists will say. So one of the big debates is whether we should have continued lockdowns. And that will be a huge trade-off between, it shouldn't be, but you know, between economy and health, because 
jobs are important for health and it is one of our national aims to keep people in work. But nevertheless, when it comes to doing things that, as Fernando says, you know, scientists might say are highly effective, like a total lockdown, you know, that isn't necessarily what government will want to do because there are other, other trade-offs. And as one of your chat uh, uh, people have said in the people in the chat, there are harms from doing some of this as well. You do cause long-term harm by doing some of this. So these are really difficult trade-offs. And I think the important thing about where science plays off is first of all, to acknowledge the limits of science and research, because we still, I have a, a third slide which shows where we need more evidence and we don't yet have it. So the limits of science, but also to be very transparent about uncertainty and where decisions are made in the best possible interests of all the trade-offs, but may not be perfect and we need to change again. And that's very, very difficult to do. Um, it's a very difficult thing for governments to do because the population wants hope and it wants certainty. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne, for, for your answer. I am now going to take a question to Sumia from the chat box from um, Bim Prasad Bakota, and I will read it to you. Um, so, Mia, the question for you is, as low middle income countries are not capable of utilizing the evidence for policy decision making, though they have ample of evidence within their own system, shall we expect the role of WHO or similar organization which can facilitate the collaboration between low middle income countries and developed countries for evidence based decision making during a public health emergency of international concern. So I read here the relationship and collaboration between low and middle and high income countries in uh, this event here. Yes, thank you, Mike, and thanks for that question. I think it's really important because what we've seen in this pandemic is that uh, it's not necessarily true that the high income countries have done well and that the low income countries haven't. We've seen a very mixed uh, pattern here. And in fact, many of the low or low middle income countries, particularly those in East Asia and quite a few in Africa, Africa, in fact, it was predicted that there would be a huge disaster and that there would be just people dying and that there, it would be a terrible, terrible situation. Now that has not come to pass, luckily. And many people are wondering why, what could be the reason? There are many reasons, including the demographics, the age profile, the median age in Africa is 22 years, as opposed to you know the mid forties in Europe, for example. So we know that has an impact on clinical course and mortality, but also, the low-income countries in many cases have invested more in their you know, primary and community health systems rather than in very sophisticated tertiary systems. Vietnam is a good example of a country that has invested in primary health care, public health over a period of time. And what they did was very rapid response. Initially, they took it extremely seriously and you know, started closing down travel from, from Wuhan. They put in place uh, screening Every individual who had a history of exposure was put into isolation, was tracked, put into quarantine rather. And once there were confirmed cases, they had to quickly scale up their diagnostic capacity. They were very, very strict about contact tracing, quarantining. They made arrangements for community quarantine so that people don't stay in their own homes. And this is a lesson we learned from China because most of the spread of this virus is occurring within uh, homes, 10% secondary attack rate, um, a much less secondary attack rate in other uh, environments. So China quickly moved from home quarantining to facility-based quarantining based on their own observations. So I think this was an example of learning from your own experience. Uh, and many countries are doing that now, Switzerland, France, they've looked at their own data and tried to figure out where the transmissions are happening and, uh, and, and take action, you know, try to produce those exposures. Now, um, so I think LMICs, we can't say that they don't have the capacity, but what 
I think the, the point I'd like to make in, in response is learning from each other is an important um, in the in a pandemic in a in a condition in a situation where we don't know much and and some strategies work and we need to learn and understand and adapt those and other strategies fail we have to also have to learn from those so what we've done is we started these member state uh, briefings every thursday starting from very early on this is apart from the press conferences and other kinds of interactions that who has and every Thursday, six countries present their experiences by rotation, one from every region usually. We have six WHO regions. And then there's a question and answer and a discussion so that you know country A is asking country B, okay, that, that looks very good, how did you do that? And very often you have senior people, sometimes the minister themselves or uh, the secretary of health, you know, making these presentations and having these discussions. And I think that was incredibly useful. In, in sharing experiences early on, particularly early on, but, but even now. And then the other thing we tried to do is to, uh, is to set up platforms where we could learn and share experiences. So we have platforms to share country experiences, but also something called a, a, a digital uh, uh, health clearing house where we are bringing solutions uh, quite often from the private sector and, and having some kind of a vetting of those solutions uh, and then putting them in one place so that anyone who's looking for a particular solution can go in and search from the available examples to see if there's something that fits their needs. And eventually we're going to move towards uh, to developing norms and standards around digital health solutions uh, because that's something that's been missing. Um, so I think this is a very good, um, question and a good example of how we can use this opportunity to learn and also strengthen those institutions within countries which clearly you know are not there so every country can can look at themselves after they've heard from the others and say these are areas which are weak which we might need to uh, do better next time thank you very much uh, i'm asking eva who is checking the chat box um, if you have identified a question that we can raise to our speakers otherwise i will pick the question we have prepared well there's lots of um, interesting questions in the chat box and i think we've touched a little bit or, or several of them touched upon this issue that sumia has also just mentioned how we need to learn from each other and I think, first of all, I need to apologize. We have assembled a mostly European panel. And uh, the reason for that was that at the time when we set up this panel, we thought the World Health Summit was going to take place as a real event in Europe. But with all the travel restrictions in place, we wanted to be on the safe side. There may be a little bit of a European bias in this, which is why I think we should pick up some of these questions from the chat, which deal with the role of low and middle income countries. So I'm, I'm trying to summarize them somehow, and maybe this is particularly for um, Froda um, and also Fernando, given that both of you have um, invested a lot of time in Africa in particular. I mean, what can we learn from what is going on in low income or middle income countries that are doing really well for how the second wave is currently affecting Europe? And then there's also this issue that sometimes decision-making happens maybe in a more evidence-informed manner than it actually does in Europe. So is that something you might also want to comment on? So particularly a question for Froda and Fernando, I think. Yeah, maybe I could start. I, I think it's, uh, it's really a, a striking uh, feature that, that you've been alluding to also, Sumoya, that the African countries have so far relatively come well out of this except maybe South Africa. And, and I think uh, we were all worried in the beginning. And I think we see, as you say, the demographics of the country. People are living much more in rural areas, areas in many parts of Africa still. They travel less. Uh, and uh, I think also the, uh, the focus on, on primary health care. And also that, that a lot of African society are used to dealing with tough conditions. I have to remind that every year, every year, 1.1 million people die of TB. Every year, 800,000 people die of HIV and AIDS. And every year, like 600,000 people die of malaria. 
so I think there is something about the the um, uh, burden of disease that is still there on a daily basis in some of these African countries that is still outruling what is happening with COVID. And, and the, uh, the, this is something also we need to work on when it comes to really saying, how can we deal with this for the future? Yeah, we have to build health systems that can deal with all diseases in all situations, in peacetime as well as during a crisis. So I think that's a, a part of also the way we should discuss the international health regulations in the aftermath of this. How can it really be supportive for all countries in all situations? And having also this focus on how countries can support each other in implementing the regulations and strengthening health systems. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Maybe I, I may complement what Frodo said because I, I really agree with what he said. Um, low, low and middle income countries, uh, is, they are probably not notifying too many cases. Uh, there are some issues regarding that. And I'm, I'm sorry if I may hurt somebody, but it's it's not easy to understand exactly how good are the surveillance systems, how good are the diagnosis capacity. We, we do not have the perfect capacities in, in higher income countries, but it's true that, that um, despite uh, the high capacity of some of, of Northern countries or high income countries, we are detecting very low number of cases. So we have to be careful when, when assessing the situation in, in low-income countries. But it's true, as Frode said, that the structure of the population, and Sumin, uh, Sumia said also, the structure of the population may, may made a completely different evolution of the outbreak as we have seen in, in higher income countries with much older and fragile populations. That may have a real, a real impact on the evolution and that may may be represented in these differences we have. Still, I agree also with, with uh, Sumia that the effort low and middle income countries are doing for in, improving their primary health care capacities much more than in many developed countries we are doing or, or higher income countries we are doing, uh, may help also to control the disease. In many of, of the higher income, income countries, we look for a high level hospitals with the last more complicated technique for publicity, for showing off, for whatever reason. And in some areas, not I don't think it's, it's homogeneous everywhere, but in some areas in high income countries, high primary health care has, has not been very much uh, improved or at least not as much as we had needed for this pandemic. I think also that an important advantage in some low and middle income countries, and, and please do not misunder, misunderstand me, is that having less number of scientists and scientific institutions working in the countries may help to have a unique scientific voice. While as Yvonne said right now in higher income countries with plenty of institutions, plenty of PhD students, plenty of researchers from every sector, because right now, mm, I thought in Spain we had four, five, six units for modeling diseases. With the uh, COVID, I realized that every single engineer, epidemiologist, statistician, mathematician, student of statistics, a student of PhD has become a very high level modeler. And I don't think this is a major problem in some lower income countries. So they may have a more easily a single scientific voice that may help decision makers to be faster or to be more precise in their, in their decision making. But it's true that at the same time, having less scientific institution creates less opportunity for discussion and generating more, more knowledge. So, I, I'm, I'm in, a, in a not very sure position for understanding what are the reasons why in developing countries or in lower and middle income countries, this situation has not been the same as in, in higher income countries. I, I'm debating between the, the surveillance capacity, their primary health care capacities are for their um, unique scientific voice and therefore more easy or faster decision making at political level. I don't think there is a single reason and, and I, I'm not sure if, if all of them are pointing in the same direction. Uh, 
they are helpful or they are bad things for decision making. It's difficult to 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 understand really the situation in these countries. I'm sorry not to be more precise. Thank you very much, Fernando. I think we all deal with a huge amount of uncertainty. So being precise is uh, absolutely difficult. Um, Eva, I would say we move on to our spotlight on evidence, um, also considering the questions um, still in the chat box and also picking up maybe the example of schools at se uh, settings of uh, transmissions. There's also a question going in this direction. Over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. It's been a very exciting debate so far and a lot of engagement from the audience. So I fear we may not be able to address all the questions that are on our minds and on people's minds. Um, but I think you've all touched upon in your um, statements on the challenge of what, re what constitutes reliable evidence, on the challenges of making decisions in the absence of evidence in the presence of changing evidence <laughs> with emerging knowledge. So we would just like to shed a little bit more light on what constitutes valid, valid evidence for decision making. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll um, first ask you, Frode, <laughs> given that you're very well known to those of the evidence-based medicine movement as somebody who's always been pushing for the use of um, evidence in public health decision making, um, including through your role with the Guidelines International Network. I mean, during this current pandemic and the current crisis, could you shed some more light on this distinction between an expert giving advice, a single study emerging that may immediately be used for the decision-making process, or what in the more traditional sense is considered evidence, scientific evidence, this use of um, systematic reviews, and maybe just tell us a little bit about the Norwegian experience with that uh, again. And um, maybe just one more sentence to all of our speakers. It would be really nice if we could keep answers quite brief so that we can then try and get through or at least touch upon as many of the interesting questions as possible. Yeah, thank you for this uh, intriguing question, I would say. And I suspect maybe one of the chairs would expect me here to quote myself from many years back when I was saying, and I'm still happy to say, in situations where there is lack of evidence and lack of time, that's when we really need the experts. And uh, this was a very controversial statement in the EBM family some years back, when the slogan was that experts were per se biased because they only knew what they knew based on their own experience and a, uh, their own expertise, and not what uh, all others knew presumably based on systematic reviews. My view is that as long as you unpack the knowledge of the expert, it is super valuable in a crisis situation because it often constitutes this integrated resource of evidence from own research and others, from experience, and maybe from having seen something similar like this before. Experts are not per se arrogant. They can be as humble as other people and extremely valuable to guide decisions when there is a lack of time and lack of formal research evidence. At our institute, we are actually lucky to have an infectious disease division and a division for evidence-based medicine, previously known as the Norwegian Knowledge Center for Health Services within the same organization. And as mentioned earlier, we give advice, produce guidance and risk assessment at the high speed. And we realized early the huge need for support to search for and to sort out and to appraise the evidence from new studies at a pace never experienced before. Many studies are only published in preprints without proper peer review processes. Mm. We established then a rapid review team within the Institute with some two or three people at each side on the methodology side and, and some of the expert side on infectious diseases and, and, and public health. And we produced some 14 rapid uh, reviews now uh, and some of them already with updates. And these are all available in English at our website. As we, uh, as well, so we have published a paper in Eurosurveil and also describing some of the challenges of taking these shortcuts in the evidence-based ways of working. Mm. And as the evidence base has grown, 
we have had to rely more on international networks to be able to cope and to keep up with all the studies. Mm -hmm. And that the coordination done here from WHO has been very valuable. Uh, another contribution from our side has been to establish this live evidence map where we code and classify studies for all relevant COVID-19 related questions, helping others to find relevant studies and to include them in their evidence assessments. These are also available at the website of FHI.no and you can find an English version there. And as of 13th of October, the map contained around 11,000 publications categorized by topic, population, publication type. And uh, they include all systematic reviews, health technology assessment, RCTs, prospective non-randomized studies with control groups. And uh, these are all the papers and identified up to the 14th of September. Uh, for instance, on the, on the question of face mask, we've also tried to really use the evidence to decision framework, trying to be explicit on what is the scientific evidence, what is the judgment, based on rationale, and what are the political issues in that question, which is also published as a rapid uh, review from our side. And we've also been part of uh, doing a small study in the guidelines international network, where we've asked the members to see what kind of processes are needed to facilitate rapid processes of guideline development in this situation. And a lot of shortcuts have to be done and still you have to have an integrated way of collaboration between professionals on the methodology side and on the science side. And also really a way of involving stakeholders early in the processes, in these shortcut processes. Mm -hmm. So that will hopefully come as a publication very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frodo. That was a very rich answer. And in fact, I have a few kind of follow-up questions that I'll try and um, distribute to our, um, to our other speakers. You've touched upon the importance of experts. So, Fernando, um, it would be really nice to hear from you what constitutes the right expert. And I know Yvonne earlier um, sort of very nicely introduced us to what has been happening in different stages of the pandemic in the UK in terms of who was asked to, or what kind of scientific um, evidence was used. You know, initially the epidemiologists and the modelers. And only now uh, the behavioral scientists are sort of more coming into play. From the German perspective, I can say that at least the initial months, it was the virologists and the intensive care people talking, modelers to some extent, and public health for a long time wasn't really heard. So again, um, Fernando, if you can just be quite brief, a few sentences, what disciplines have been involved in Spain in all of this? I try to summarize. It's been that it's been evolving all along the, the epidemic. At the beginning, modelers, as you mentioned, were very important, not, not only because of the scientific point of view, but also because of the population point of view. They needed to know what they could expect. But it's true that models at the beginning were not that good. We had too many uncertainties, uncertainties to understand what to introduce as the preconditions for the models, and that was not easy to do. Then we start having um, a number of cases. Then at that moment, uh, clinicians start to become the important people. Uh, they start to become those who had to learn how to treat patients. ICU experts were the important people to deal with those who were almost dying and to reduce mortality. And then we start having in Spain the key actors um, who were social workers and people Though, and mainly those working with um, uh, nursing nursing homes and the elderly homes, etc. That was a, an important issue here in Spain and I guess in some other countries. From then on, we had the epidemiologists well, well, were all over the process in the middle, trying to connect one discipline with another and trying to help to make sense of all the information that was arising. And I think in Spain, uh, epidemiologists and public health specialists were more or less taken into account when decision making. It's true that in, at some points there was a lot of social pressure, but those legitimated for doing decision, for making decision, were really paying attention to epidemiologists and public health specialists. And then we start with the, with the going down with the months of May and, uh, and June and July. And at that moment, uh, people experts in immunology, vaccines, new treatments, communication, etc., start becoming the important ones. 
And now we have a new group, which is arising very strongly, are the engineers. The engineers experts who are experts in aerosols, who are experts in small, small drops transmission and the role of air conditioning, et cetera, in the potential transmission of aerosols. The problem is that they have to be coupled with uh, infection control experts because one thing is that an aerosol can circulate and another thing is that the aerosol can really transmit. So, or how much it transmits because of course aerosols are transmitting. So we, the problem is that all these people is usually working in an isolated way and is the role of public health specialists, epidemiologists to, pour, to put all that knowledge together and make sense out of it for informing properly the decision makers. And I think the epidemiologists have been all over the process, uh, been on the background, putting all this together in the same, with a, with a common sense and making the proper weight for each one of these science. Thanks very much. I mean, one, one thing that comes to mind in listening to you is that we are, maybe we haven't brought the economists, the economists in um, sufficiently in some of these social science um, disciplines. Um, and that to me touches upon both the comment in the chat about the harms of the interventions that we're currently running, the harms to health, but also the harms to our economies, to our societies. And it also touches upon one of you saying earlier how we need to weigh issues of effectiveness of interventions versus feasibility versus acceptability. Now, Sumya, if I may turn to you, um, and maybe starting off with a quote from one of the sessions yesterday where uh, Lothar Wieler, the head of the Robert Koch Institute said, this pandemic is about three things, trust, trust, and trust in science. And of course, the WHO has a really key role in informing um, the world about this pandemic. Now, how at WHO have you been trying to make sense of all these complexities going on and drawing up recommendations that make use of the scientific evidence and the different types of evidence and weighing these criteria um, of acceptability, feasibility, and so on? Thank you, Eva. That's a really important. Uh question because we know that um, doing things based on a biomedical model alone, uh, we've seen from history that doesn't often always work. And so I think the point about needing the social science, the behavioral science aspects, including economists um, is, is key. And, and we recognized that even before the pandemic, and we had started preparing to set up a behavioral insights group, which we've actually done now. So we have a behavioral insights group. And one of the first things that the DG has asked them to look at is this whole um, question about vaccine acceptance and how we can better promote the acceptance, not just of COVID vaccines when they're available, but we know in general that there is a problem in many countries uh, on acceptance of vaccines, um, and which has which, uh, resulted in the re-emergence of many of the vaccine preventable diseases like measles. So they, 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 uh, the group now is going, to, is going to advise WHO on how to incorporate these behavioral insights into our guidelines so that they are likely to have more impact. So I think that's a very good first step. I mentioned that we had this research forum, research and innovation forum in February, where we are looking at different aspects of the knowledge gaps, you know, around transmission, clinical management, vaccines, and so on. But at that time, we also set up a group on social and behavioral sciences, and it was supposed to be a cross-cutting group. So they have worked with each of the other different scientific groups and brought their expertise and insights into uh, into the policy making and guidance. The third is, I think, when we discuss about countries that have had better uh, outcomes than others, one of the important elements is the question of trust between the public and the government, but also on how well the communities have been engaged and empowered to act. And I think in the beginning, it, it started off as a rather top-down approach in many countries. And soon, 
I think there was recognition that this isn't working for many reasons. You know, again, it differs by country. And when governments or local public health authorities started engaging communities uh, and having a discussion with them and also addressing their problems. So I mentioned Vietnam, but there are other places also, like if you take people who are very poor and who are living in environments where they do not have access to water, to soap, or they do not have any place where they can isolate themselves or quarantine themselves. It is ridiculous to ask them to do these things, to wash their hands frequently when they do not have water, uh, let alone soap. So I think we have to, policymakers then recognize this and started maybe tailoring messages or providing the support that people needed. And I think question that is asked about the counterfactual or rather the the impact on um, on society as a whole of some of the some of the um, measures that were put in place, uh, I think, have been extremely severe, uh, including, of course, on the loss of livelihoods, but also on the impact on other essential health services. And Frode mentioned about the impact on TB and HIV, but also on non-communicable diseases, cancer treatment, essential um, surgery, blood transfusions. So many uh, services were disrupted um, across countries. We did a pulse survey that showed the majority of countries, immunization services and antenatal and <clears throat> maternal and child health services were disrupted. And this goes back to the resilience of health systems. I think it became clear that very few countries had the resilience to respond to both COVID-19 and to maintain essential uh, health services. And again, it's, this happens only if you've been investing systematically. So I think looking ahead, we've learned a lot of lessons on where we need to invest. And I think the interface between the health delivery at the primary care level and the communities themselves. And generally this interface is through community health workers in many of the low and middle income countries. And I think having that workforce of community health workers that has the trust of the community, that is very much used to dealing with the community and in passing on messages and in is, is perhaps something we should really look to in the future, whether it's a high income country or a low income country trying to make adjustments to their uh, health systems. Thank you, Sumya. That was really insightful in many respects. You talked about many of the harms um, that have occurred in terms of other essential healthcare functions not happening, the importance of resilience, resilient health systems and trust. Um, <laughs> Um, just thinking in terms of time, we have six minutes left and a lot of questions from the audience. I'd quite like to put one more question to Yvonne um, and then I think we'll just see where we are, Maike, in terms of whether we can pick up another question from the audience or whether we can just do one final round of quick um, answers or qu uh, quick statements. Um, Yvonne, I think maybe going back to where we started earlier today, evidence-based decision making and also touching upon Froda saying, you know, in the pandemic, you know, sometimes we don't have the evidence, we rely on experts. And Richard Horton saying this week in The Lancet, evidence alone will never be enough. We need to understand how this whole decision making process happens. The public health community must learn to think more about the intersection between politics and health. Your view coming from uh, Public Health England. <laughs> How does all of this fit together? How have you been using your strategic role in terms of being very linked with the science and very linked with the decision-making? And maybe what are some of the facilitators and barriers to using evidence and decision-making processes? Lots of questions, sorry. Well, the um, Eva, the role of public health is to synthesize the ology, what I call the ologies, all the ologies that have jumped in. You know, we've, we've segmented all our knowledge here into virology epidemiology, socio, I mean, sociology, whatever, lots of it. Uh, and we make sense of it in terms of the impact on a population. What does this mean for people living in the north of England or the southwest of England or in Bristol? Uh, and we use our local knowledge for that. And that is the purpose of having a public health system is that it reaches from national through to local. And that's what we've been trying to do throughout this. 
Um, and in many ways, that's not a star performing role. We're not the experts in front of the camera every day uh, talking about this. We're trying to actually make sure that what we're doing does more good than harm and that understands the dynamics of the populations that we're working with. So that's our job. And as a practitioner, I'm not just sitting, you know, talking to ministers or looking nationally. I'm also looking locally uh, for what my place based knowledge should be telling us. I think we need to um, build on the issue of where we have uncertainty and how we recover. And I would say, you know, my next role is really to look to the longer term harms that, uh, and benefits. So we build on the opportunities that we've gathered, maybe around technology, but we also understand that we don't do more harm than good as we go forward. And I've laid out the four types of harm that we've identified um, and how we don't make inequalities worse by how we go forward. And, and these are big jobs to do right now, even as we try and control this wave. Do more good than harm. That's, I think, the challenge for all of us in trying to manage this pandemic. So really, um, really insightful. Micah, do we have time for one more question from the audience or do we do our closing round? I think on my watch is three more minutes. So unfortunately, no more time for another question. But as we said, we all save them and send them to the speakers. Maybe some of them inform their decisions. We'll see. So maybe one super brief last round of um, thoughts and maybe also next steps of our speakers. Maybe Frode, you want to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think in Norway, it's been crucial that the whole of the government has been involved in this uh, handling of the pandemic from the 12th of March. That's when we, we took, they took over from the uh, role of the experts and the whole of the government went in and our prime minister took the key role and I think all ministries as has been mentioned from from UK have been involved in this it has been striking the whole of society and our role is partly to feed them in the information but not always on all the questions and we have to also I think rely that politicians are the best people to take those broad decisions that's why we've elected them and it's not our role to be there it's our role to guide them on those decisions and then I think also guiding them on allowing to be uncertain when there is lack of evidence and lack of knowledge. Our director often says at the press conferences, this I don't know, and this we don't know yet. There is need for more evidence, there is need for better data, there is need for more research in this field. In that sense, I think uh, going forward with transparency and openness in also communicating both what we know and what we don't know will be a way forward to try and stop it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, being honest and open and transparent. Great last words, thank you very much. Fernando, would you like to make your last comment as brief as possible? It will be very brief because Frode already said what I wanted to say. This is not a health sector issue. This pandemic is a multi-sector, all the society uh, issue and it's the responsibility of everybody to, to control it. It's not only the government, it's not only scientists, the whole population. And I think um, communication is a key factor for controlling this. We are going um, month after month implementing new measures. We are tired, everybody's tired, and communication is gonna play a major role in the future. In the future, I hope weeks or months maximum. Thank you very much. Uh, Yvonne, some last words and ideas from your side. I haven't much to add, actually. I think I've said it, really. We've got to do our best and look forward to ensuring that we recover. Thank you. Sumya, last words from your side. I would say that a pandemic, a shock like this, actually has demonstrated the need for global collaboration and solidarity, particularly in the areas of, of research, of data, of um, of using each other's experiences and also biological specimens, genetic sequence data. So we need to develop global, regional and national governance mechanisms to address this so that we're not struggling in the middle of a pandemic 
to figure out how we're going to do this. And I think this goes very much along with the European Commission's move to open science, open research, open data. We've demonstrated that it works. And, and so we must extend it to other diseases, other public health uh, challenges that uh, humanity faces. Thank you. Thank that, you. Was a, that was a fantastic closing round. So I've taken note of um, the great statements you made. And I think we now have to thank you and say goodbye to you. And as, I want, just want to add a special thing. You're all, we're all in the middle of managing this pandemic and you took the time out from your busy schedule to be here for this session. And um, I think it's been really valued by our audience that has stayed with us um, during the last hour and a half. And that has posed lots of questions. So a big thanks from me. And also from my side, of course, thank you very much uh, for being with us and taking the time. And I'd like also to thank the German Global Health uh, Research Alliance to supporting and hosting this session in new structure in Germany that brings together um, all the experts um, in global health research. So we are also doing some kind of coordination and structure improvements here in Germany. Thank you very much for joining us and staying two minutes over time.